Um, I don't often think of the, the world of philosophy as a very exciting place. It's not a place that I typically think of as uh, particularly dramatic or a place where there are famous stories to be told. Um, but there's one particular story. There was a, a single day in 1946 in Cambridge in England when two philosophers met together for the first and last time. These two individuals uh, were very well known in their respective fields. One of the individuals was actually the chair of the Cambridge Moral uh, Thinking Club, this idea of, of people, or this group of people who were getting together to debate various philosophical ideas. His name was Ludwig Wittgenstein, and he was German, and he was actually, uh, actually Austrian, and he had um, been an immigrated and assimilated Jew living in Austria who had moved to Cambridge. The other individual was also Austrian. He was also Jewish, and his name was Karl Popper. These two individuals knew of each other, but they had never met before, and Karl Popper had it out for Ludwig. Ludwig was a, was a very well-known individual. He was very famous. He had ideas that were, that were gathering steam in all of the philosophical world. And these two guys began to be somewhat at odds with one another to the point in which Karl Popper scheduled an opportunity to come from London to Cambridge and present a paper in front of not only this individual, but also all of their colleagues and students alike. They were all going to gather while the two of them debated the ideas presented in one of Karl's papers. Now, what Carl did not understand, what he didn't know, was that Wittgenstein had this reputation of having a very short temper. He had a reputation of interrupting people in the middle of their talks. He had a reputation of leaving meetings before they were done. He was essentially a jerk. And he had no idea what he was getting himself into as he arrives. He shows up at this room in Cambridge, and it's a small room where there's a fireplace, and all of these men have packed into this room, and sitting by the fireplace is Wittgenstein. He's sitting there kind of waiting as a taunt for this individual to present his ideas. In the room, there are notable, notable philosophers, like Bertrand Russell is a key character in this story, known for generations after this. But they begin to talk, and shortly into Popper's presentation, Wittgenstein interrupts him, and now they begin to banter back and forth. And at one point in all of the banter, and the story varies in terms of who you talk to, what the details were, at one point, Wittgenstein goes to the fireplace, and he grabs a fireplace poker in this philosophical conversation, in this reasonable gathering of men, right? He gathers this thing up and waves it around in the room. Now, this part becomes very controversial because nobody to this day can affirm what exactly took place with the fireplace poker in the H3 room at Cambridge in October of 1946. It's kind of a clue game of sorts. All we know is that something was said, words were exchanged, and shortly after... Wittgenstein took the poker, set it down, and walked out of the room abruptly, leaving everybody standing, wondering what had just happened. Now, this is what took place in the, in the days that followed. Pretty soon, rumors began to swirl. People began to speculate and say various things. Popper himself began claiming a victory. In fact, there was a very famous statement because he was battling the idea of fundamental moral principles. And Popper said, one such moral principle is never threaten your opponent with a fireplace poker. He began claiming a victory. Others said that Popper had nothing to do with it. Some people said that actually Bertrand Russell had said something to Wittgenstein that irritated him, which caused him to get angry. Some people debated whether or not he was using the fireplace poker as an illustration or whether or not he was actually threatening it, and nobody really knows. Popper claims he was threatening him with it. Some people said that the poker was hot. Some people said the poker was cold. There were letters that were being written to Popper asking for him to explain what had taken place because nobody really knew. All of the people present had different stories, different ideas, different perspectives of what was going on. Now, that's not an unusual thing to have happen, right? You have eyewitnesses to events, you have lawyers, you have representatives, and the varying people who are witnesses or people who are understanding certain events, they take those events and they do their best to assess what took place. However, in doing so, oftentimes there's discrepancy, is there not? 
Oftentimes, when two different people get together on one thing that both have seen, there are different ideas of what has taken place. That was the case this day in Cambridge. There are different ideas of what took place, all kinds of debate about whether or not one person was angry or not, or what was spoken. But what nobody debates is whether or not the event took place. Everybody knows something happened that day. Which brings us to this day. It brings us to this reality, this thing called the resurrection that we come to gather and celebrate. We don't celebrate the cross as much as we celebrate the resurrection on this day, which is a very interesting thing. Today on this day, this day we call Easter, millions of people are gathering in rooms and halls and churches all around the world to celebrate something that happened, an event that took place on a particular day. And while some people may struggle, while we may wrestle with the idea of affirming a bodily resurrection of Jesus as a historical reality, the truth of that day is very difficult to dismiss. Something happened. With all of the arguments and all of the presentations and all of the perspectives that we hear in the world today about the events surrounding the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, the one thing that we know for certain is that something happened. There's no denying it. There, the accounts, they may vary in, in what took place. The perspectives, they may be different. But the truth of something actually happening in that moment is undeniable. Now, The, the question that becomes glaringly obvious out of this, and the answer to the question impacts all of our life, is this. Did Jesus truly rise from the dead? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Did this man who laced his language with metaphor, speaking of his future suffering and resurrection, did he actually go through with it? Did it actually come true? Isn't it much more enlightened and much more reasonable for us to take a step back from the resurrection with the wisdom and the knowledge that we obtain today and say that these events were either myth or hallucination? Wouldn't it be easier for us to look at these things and say the empty tomb is some sort of spiritualized idea or maybe it is some sort of theological truth. Maybe the resurrection is something that happens in some sort of symbolic metaphysical level, but it's not really a physical resurrection that took place. We can think in those terms and we can consider those ideas as it relates to the resurrection, but here's the problem with this. The Gospels themselves present the resurrection with painstaking detail that infers that these events are actually real. The Gospels present this as this is what took place. You can read the historical documents and and you can assume metaphor or hallucination, but when you actually look at those writings themselves, they present the resurrection of Jesus as something that is physical, something that is bodily, something that is real. That is the way they told the story. Like We saw him hang on a cross, and then we saw him breathe his last breath, and we watched as his body was taken off the cross, and we know we saw them place it inside of this tomb, and we know that there was a stone, and there are soldiers. Every detail of the story presents Jesus dying and being laid in a tomb, and along with those same details is this foregone conclusion that in the morning when they arose, he was gone. He, was, he had risen. That's the way they present the story. The intended conclusion of the stories of the gospel is that he is risen. He's risen. That's the point they were getting to. It wasn't just the cross. It was this moment of him no longer being there. The statement is clear. And that statement, the statement of the gospels that presents Jesus in this way, it demands that we ourselves draw a conclusion about this. You can't read these things and find yourself just going, well, we'll see. You have to draw some sort of conclusion. You have to respond to this. You have to make a judgment because it is impossible to stay neutral with the historical presentation of what takes place in the last days of Jesus with his disciples. The resurrection of Jesus, it presents a challenge. See, the issue is not whether or not you like or dislike Jesus. Oftentimes, that's where this conversation moves. Oftentimes, when people begin talking about the cross or talk about the resurrection, 
when people begin to describe Jesus or what they like or dislike, it usually comes down to the things that he said or the things that he did. And Jesus is a very likable character. I don't know if you realize that. Like, Jesus is somebody that people really like. People liked Jesus then. People like Jesus today. Why do we like Jesus? Well, because Jesus said and did amazing things, right? Like, Jesus walked into situations where there was obvious brokenness and pain, and he brought life and healing. He was the individual that would touch those that were untouchable. He was the one who would care for those who weren't being cared for. Jesus had the audacity to stand up to the religious establishment and tell them where they were wrong. Jesus is this person that around every corner, every moment, every interaction, you see him and you go, man, I love Jesus. Like, Jesus is, like... Jimmy Fallon today, right? Like, everybody loves Jimmy Fallon. Everybody, when you look at Jesus, everybody likes Jesus. Because he says things like, I've come that you would have life and life to the full. Who doesn't love somebody who says, you came for me and you want my life to be amazing? I like you, new best friend, right? So we love Jesus. The problem is this. The problem is that All that we love about Jesus is not only presented in the context of a story that says he rose from the dead, but it's his physical resurrection that makes his promises a reality for us today. So we have to make a decision regarding the resurrection of Jesus. The issue is not whether or not you like or dislike Jesus and his teachings. The issue is whether or not you believe he rose from the dead. And if Jesus rose, if Jesus rose, well then what? What does that mean? The Apostle Paul, he stated this very clearly. And to think that we're the first generation that questioned the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus, um, the contemporaries of the disciples questioned these things. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 said these very powerful words, and I think they're very poignant for this day and age. He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised... Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He makes it very clear. The same book that presents this Jesus that so many love says, well, without the resurrection, there's really no point to this story. In other words, Jesus is either the flesh and blood Palestinian who walked and talked and died and was rose, or he's a figment of our imagination. He's a myth that we've come up with to be a solve to our questions about eternal life and where we go when we die. But, and this is what Paul is presenting, and this is what the gospel writers present, and this is what we're looking at today. If Jesus rose from the dead, then that changes everything. That changes everything. The resurrection changes everything. Our understanding of the world that we live in changes if the resurrection is true. Our understanding of our own lives, the way in which we live, the way that we interact with the world and the people around us, It changes if the resurrection is a reality. The places where we find meaning and hope and life, they change if we truly believe the resurrection. If Jesus was raised, if we move beyond the point of saying, I like his teaching, he's a good guy, to a place where we understand that Jesus was raised from the dead, that changes everything for us. One of the best examples of this is a very well-known character in the New Testament named Peter, Simon Peter. Um, And there are things that we witness in the life of Simon Peter that speak to the radical nature of what took place on the day of the resurrection. Um, the, The New Testament book of Mark is a book, it's the gospel. The gospels are the first four books of the New Testament, and they essentially are the biographies of Jesus given from four very different perspectives. The book of Mark is actually heavily influenced by the Apostle Peter. And so he had his fingerprints on this. And and in the book of Mark, there's this story that's told. Jesus is in the thick of his public ministry. Like, things are going really well. They've just fed 5,000 people. He's uh, he's been healing people that were born blind. He's um, teaching. He's establishing himself as as a leader among the people. He's confronting the religious elite. He's doing all of these sorts of things. And so, essentially, it could be summed up. Like, the tour is going really well. Like, the Jesus 
Jesus and Disciple Tour, it's going really well. People are really liking what they're seeing, right? Like sellout crowds every night, every town, right? Everybody's tweeting, everybody's hashtagging Jesus, right? Like hashtag Jesus saves, like hashtag fed the 5,000. Like you got to understand, like we joke about, but that's the kind of notoriety. There was this like social uproar, social media. Had it been invented then, Jesus would have crashed the internet, right? Like that would have happened because he was such a big deal. And so he's walking. They're in this region called Caesarea Philippi, and they're walking down the road, he and his disciples, going from village to village, like place to place. And there's this conversation that ensues between them that's really fascinating. And actually, Jesus asks a question. Some of you, you've heard this question before. Some of you have answered this question for yourself before, but I want you to look at at what it says with me. It says this in Mark chapter 8. It says that Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist and others say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. Then he flips the question on them and he says, okay, who do you say that I am? You hear all the stuff. You've been watching. You've been traveling. Who do you say I am? Peter answered him, you, you are the Christ. This is a moment in in, in Peter's life that will never be forgotten, right? Like you imagine this, they are all wondering, like who is Jesus really? Like who is this guy? They're, They're asking this question themselves. And then Peter hears the question with all of the other disciples listening and kind of wondering and no one really wanting to say because they didn't quite know themselves. Peter puts his neck out, puts his reputation on the line, and he says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You're the one that in Jewish history we have been waiting for for centuries. You're the one that prophetic literature had been written about for generation after generation after generation. You are that person. That's what Peter says to him. From a Jewish standpoint, the statement of Peter in this moment is massive, right? Like this is a massive proclamation that he's making. The question is, how did Peter get to this conclusion? How did Peter come to a place of saying, Jesus, I think you are the Christ? Well, he'd been watching, right? He was doing what many of us do. You watch and you look and, and you observe and scientifically and rationally and you watch the life of Jesus and eventually the only conclusion you're left to draw is, he's the Christ. And so Peter loves Jesus because the evidence says you ought to love this person. He's really amazing. But is that enough? Is that enough? And is that the point? See, maybe maybe we do this. Maybe you and I, we look at the facts of who Jesus is We read the historical documents, we hear the stories, we look at the evidence, and we rationalize, and we analyze, and we look at the other various options that are presented to us, and then we make some sort of conclusion. And we believe, and you may have done this, you may have at some point chosen to believe certain things to be true about Jesus, but is that what it is all about? Is that where the conversation ends? I guess the question is, is that enough And when I say enough, I think you know what I mean. Is that enough? Is that what this is all about? Does the life to the full that Jesus promised us come into reality when we believe that we scientifically, through our own analysis, have drawn the right conclusion about who he is as a historical personality? Is that enough? See, Peter, like us, he believed these things to be true but it didn't really change him. Peter's life, it wasn't really impacted by him. As you look on in the life of Peter, he fumbles around with Jesus. He he tries to make sense of who Jesus is and this message that he's proclaiming. He, he, He tries to fit Jesus into his understanding of what the world is all about. Peter had a particular view of how the world was supposed to work, and he was constantly trying to force Jesus into his understanding of how the world worked and how he would work in his world. 
Um, there, there's this one particular day where Jesus is actually talking to his disciples about what was going to come. He's beginning to describe to them the cross and the crucifixion and his death and his resurrection. And he's unpacking these things for his disciples. And Peter pulls Jesus aside for a conversation. Like, can we have a sidebar? You and I, this whole like you and the cross and suffering thing. And I want you to remember that he believes certain things to be true about Jesus, but the whole death and burial and resurrection thing, this did not fit into his construct of who Jesus is. And so in Mark 8, it says that when Jesus was talking about these things, this is what happened next. It says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I always get a kick out of this. Like, if you want to question whether or not Peter was an idiot or not, just look at these stories, right? But turning and seeing his disciples, he, speaking of Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Peter pulls Jesus aside and he says, Listen, listen, you want to talk about this whole death and suffering and crucifixion thing on your own time? That's fine, but that's going to hurt the tour, right? Like, nobody's excited about following a guy who talks about suffering all the time, right? Like, talk about happy stuff, Jesus. Can you do that? Can you talk about happy stuff? And this whole resurrection thing, we don't even know what that means. Like, that is so far beyond comprehension. We're not even sure how we could handle that, right? So let's just stick to the plot. You keep healing people. We'll just take over the world, right? That's what we're going to do. That's the way this thing is moving Peter believes some amazing things about Jesus, but because the resurrection is not a part of it, Jesus responds as if to say, if you don't get the resurrection, you don't get me. If you don't live in the reality of the resurrection, you don't understand me. And you will never understand the life that follows all of these things I'm telling you about. They are not possible without the reality of the resurrection. And that incomplete understanding on Peter's part, that misunderstanding on our part, is what leads us to this life of floundering, this incomplete life of faith. Peter spends his days just stumbling and bumbling. And there are high points and there are low points. The lowest of low points in the life of Peter Jesus gathers his disciples in the upper room right before he's arrested. They're taking their final uh, last supper together. It's a very familiar scene. In this moment, Jesus again is talking about what's going to come, his suffering and the cross and the resurrection. And in this moment, Peter begins to speak very boldly about never leaving him. And Jesus says, again, because you have no understanding of what this is all about, you are going to leave me. You will deny me and you'll do it three times. They leave that place. They go to a garden. Jesus prays. This is a very familiar part of this story for many of us. And while they're in this place of prayer, soldiers come, betrayed by Judas, and they arrest Jesus, and they haul him off. And and, and the Bible says, it says this, that John and Peter actually followed after. And so while everybody scatters, John and Peter... They're kind of chasing after and seeing where they take him. And they take Jesus to the the court of the high priest. And in the court of the high priest is where Jesus is being flogged and abused and wrongly accused. There's this horrible things that are taking place in the life of Jesus here. And, And Peter follows Jesus to this spot. And it's in this place that to a servant girl and to a couple people hanging around a fire, Peter denies that he even knows Jesus. In one week's time, Peter has gone from his PR man to not even knowing him. Somebody asks Peter this, standing by a fire. They say this in in John chapter 18. Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it. And at once, the rooster crowed. Jesus had said, three times you'll deny me before the rooster crows. Now from this point, the details are somewhat vague about Peter. He goes into hiding. He's obviously struck by the events that have taken place. It's devastating. He goes fishing, which as a guy makes total sense, right? (laughs) It's one of the things we actually know. Peter went fishing and I go, okay, I get it. I understand. Like, he just needed to blow off some steam. We go fishing. That's good. But he's just floundering. He's floundering. And here's what's fascinating. There is nothing in the story of Peter, not from the first moment that we're introduced to him to the moment that I just described. There is not one moment that gives us any sort of indication for what would happen next in the life of Peter. 
There is nothing on the radar that says the next logical step would be for this to take place. There's no place in his history that's a predictor of his behavior that says Peter would now become the person that he becomes and do the things that he now does. There is nothing that foreshadows this sort of behavior. The fumbling, the denying, the wavering faith, all of this shifts. And history tells us that in the same city, just a short time after Jesus was crucified, in the same city where individuals were so outraged that they illegally tried Jesus and released a criminal instead of him, in this same place where there was fighting and and hurling of insults towards those who were following Jesus, in this exact same place, something happens and there's a ruckus that stirs among the followers of Jesus. And in this ruckus, you can read about it in Acts chapter 2, the people began to gather around because these followers of Jesus, they're up to it again. They're starting to mess with things, and we need to do something. And so the crowd gathers around, and they're speculating about all that's taking place. And in this moment, Peter does something that nobody saw coming. Peter stands up, and he gets up in front of all of these people, and he begins to proclaim who Jesus is. He begins to tell them boldly, the same people that had just crucified Jesus, Peter now stands in front of. And you wonder why. How is this possible? How could an individual who was a coward, who didn't understand, who lived this floundering sort of faith, suddenly be this bold man? The words that he spoke to this crowd are recorded, and I think we get a clue to what took place and why he was changed. He said this in Acts chapter 2. He said, men of Israel, and I'll paraphrase a few things and put a few things together because it's very long and we only have time for one sermon today and it's mine. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up or, or according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I want you to think about what he's saying. You killed Jesus. God raised him up. In front of thousands of people, he is saying, Jesus is risen. God raised him up. Loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of all that we all, and that we are all witnesses, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made both him, Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Here's Jesus like standing up in front of everybody saying, Jesus is risen. Here's Peter doing this. And Peter, you look at this and think, who is this guy, right? Like, where did this guy come from? How does he make this transformation? What's the difference? And here's what's fascinating. Peter didn't just have one shining moment. This isn't like the great moment that Peter had and then we never really heard from him again. Peter is not a one-hit wonder. Several years ago, I stood in Vatican City and I just was an absolute awe at St. Peter's Basilica, one of the most beautiful structures ever built on the planet. And it's built in the name of this denying, cowardly, mistake-making Peter. How do you explain this? How do you explain that today, that man, thousands of people will gather every day and just stand over the place where he's buried in reverence for the kind of life that he lived? How does a person begin his story the way that his story began and finish the way that his story finished? How is this possible? There is only one thing. There's only one thing, and it's the common thread that runs through all people who have lived remarkable lives of faith in Jesus. It was... And it is the reality of the resurrection. Peter had witnessed the resurrection, and now he is living in its significance. The man was dead, and now he's alive. He's seeing this. Like, we've never seen this before. If you see this, you don't forget it, right? It's game-changing, How else do you explain the transformation of Peter? How else do you describe this? He saw something. He witnessed something. He proclaimed something. And that changed everything. If Jesus is raised, if Jesus is raised, that changes everything. And so the question that asks, is asked to us is this. What do you believe about the resurrection? What do you believe? Not just about Jesus and whether or not he's a nice guy. 
What do you believe about the resurrection? I realize this is a big question for some of you, but it's a question that the story of Jesus is screaming to us on a day like today. The resurrection changes everything. It is the heart of the Christian message. It is not simply a belief statement. The resurrection of Jesus is not something we sing or say or ascribe to. The resurrection of Jesus is not some sort of rational idea that we just hold to. The resurrection of Jesus is the centerpiece of what it means to be a Christ follower. The heart of the Christian faith is the resurrection The resurrection of Jesus changes everything that we understand about the world that we live in and the lives that we're living in it. All of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of those things are reshaped and formed by the truth of the resurrection. Death was defeated. God has entered our world. God has brought new creation. He's inaugurated a new way of living with him and with others. We get this glimpse of God's power and his desire and his hope for humanity. Reality is completely redefined by the resurrection. The resurrection means this. There is more to this life than what we're living on the surface. So we live this narrative. We live this life on the surface. And the resurrection says, wait a second, there's a subplot. And when you understand the subplot of the resurrection, that is the only time when the narrative that you're living on the surface actually begins to make sense. See, oftentimes we're looking for the depths of life on the surface when they're really beneath in the story of the resurrection. The resurrection brings all of life to life. The resurrection is what makes sense of all of this. That's why our search for meaning, our search for significance, we find it and we, we, we look for it in material goods and we bounce from thing to thing or fling to fling or place to place, always trying to satisfy this seeking that's inside of us. We are always looking for depth at the surface and the resurrection says there's another story that's beneath the surface that makes your story make sense. No wonder these things never last. No wonder the things that we try to pursue, the careers, the possessions, the activities, the experiences, no wonder these things never seem to last. They were never meant to. They just provide the setting for living a resurrected sort of life. There's a story in John chapter 5 where Jesus walks into this place. It's in the thick of the public ministry that's booming. And there's this place that, that's called the Pool of Bethesda, and it was like a magic pool. And it was understood that when the water stirred in this pool, if you were uh, experiencing some sort of ailment and somebody put you in the water or you stepped into that water, you would be immediately healed by stepping into that. Jesus walks into this colonnade around this area and there's this individual who's sitting there and he's been sitting there for a very long time. This man was born unable to walk. Jesus comes into this place and the man begins to describe this myth to him. He looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, you know, there's the problem. And the problem is this water could potentially fix my problem. I just can't seem to get in there. If only somebody could lower me into it. When you think about it, it's a ridiculous story because here's Jesus. He's been healing people everywhere. And this guy's like, Jesus, I don't really want your healing. Could you just get me to the water? And it makes you wonder how many cultural myths we find ourselves sitting by, waiting for them to satisfy the deeper longings of our souls when Jesus is standing there while we tell him, could you please do this? And would you provide this? And it'd be nice, or I don't like you right now because you didn't give me what I want. And he's saying, listen, that's a myth that will never satisfy. I'm right here. That's the beauty of of the resurrection, there is another story and we get to live in that story and that gives us hope. Hope is when we understand that there is a story that makes sense of our story. Hope comes when we understand there is a story that gives context for our story and we are invited to live in that story. That's where we find hope. The other day I was organizing some things at our house and I found my Letterman jacket. <clears throat> I chuckled when I found it for a couple of different reasons. Number one, I was arrogant <laughs> when I looked back at high school because there were patches and all kinds of stuff on it. And I thought, who does this? Like, imagine as an adult, you wearing your achievements out every day. Oh, look at me. Promotion last week. Like, you got a patch, right? 
So I kind of chuckled. I was looking. I thought, good thing we don't do that today. That'd be really embarrassing, you know, just still walking around today. And then I also chuckled because I grew up in Phoenix. And I stood there and I thought, why didn't we have like Letterman tank tops? <laughs> that would have made a whole lot more sense. Like the jacket didn't get worn much, right? But then I was looking at it, and, and I looked at it, and this blew my mind. As I was kind of grabbing it and looked, I noticed that there was a cross on the sleeve of my Letterman jacket, and it surprised me. I forgot that I had a cross on the sleeve of my Letterman jacket when I was in high school. And I actually stood there in my house looking at it, and I thought, why would I have done that? And I asked that question not because of the reason you may think, I ask that question because from my perspective and what I now know of Jesus and his resurrection, the day that I made the decision to put a cross on my letterman jacket was just like the day that Jesus walked with Peter and his disciples and said, who do you say that I am? And I said, ah, I guess you're probably who you say you are, and I guess if I want a ticket to heaven, i got to believe it, so put the cross on, here we go. It meant nothing to me compared to the power of the resurrection that I know today. There's a difference between believing certain things about Jesus and living in the reality of the resurrection, which might explain why for many of us we believe certain things to be true. We hold certain truths to be self-evident, but in the deepest parts of our lives, we know we are not experiencing the life to the full that Jesus came and said, I'm giving this to you. That is the power of the resurrection. Something that day happened. He has risen. And the question is, do you believe that? This life that you're living has every opportunity to be life, to be filled with life. This life you're living, you can wake up to the new reality of the resurrection. And maybe you've had your dusty side of the road, Jesus, I believe these things about you moment. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't even gone there. Regardless, a day like today presents a question in front of you. It says, would you like to have a resurrected kind of life? That's the question of this day. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are, the reality of the resurrection breaks into our circumstance and gives us hope. Amen? The resurrection of Jesus makes a statement. It makes a statement that this world that we're living in matters. The dirt and the sweat and the blood and the tears and the flesh and the trees and the friends and the life and the laughter and the joys and the sorrows, all of that matters. That's what the resurrection says. You and I are not just killing time until time kills us. That is not what this is about. The resurrection says God has entered in and he will turn this black and white surface narrative of your life into something that is full-blown color when we say yes and we choose to live in and a part of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me? May you do more than just love who Jesus is. May you believe the resurrection and may your life be a reflection of all that Jesus promised and all that he gave, not just for you, but for this world. Amen? Amen. If someone...